Writing for a Living, Story Basics. Hey, I'm Stefan Petruka, author of over 20 books and hundreds of graphic novels, and this is the second sample lecture from my complete two-hour video course, Writing for a Living, The Query, available via the link in the description below. Whether it's fiction or nonfiction, everyone has an intuitive understanding of what constitutes a story. But when it comes down to presenting that story in the short space of a query, it's important to consider a more mechanical definition. So here I'll be presenting an overview of that more mechanical definition through a look at the four parts of the story. Character, conflict, complications, and closure. In the full course, I take a closer look at each and conclude with the way accenting one element more than another can influence audience expectations. Before I try to answer that basic question, what is a story, I want to stress two things. The first is not only the importance of storytelling in our daily lives, but its utter universality. If you're a human being, you just can't get away from it. I've heard many professional authors express extreme irritation with the way so many people out there think anyone can just sit down and write a story. But too bad for them, because the fact is, yes, anyone can just sit down and write a story. You don't even have to sit down. Humans are natural storytellers. It's what we do. It's how we think. Whenever we talk about our goals, our friends, our lovers, our days, our feelings, our struggles, we tell ourselves and each other's stories. We tell tall tales, short tales, tales of daring do, tales of cowardice, of love, of cosmic consequence and dental appointments. Most of us are pretty good at it. Some of us even have a knack. To be clear, telling a story and getting someone to pay to hear that story are very different things. The professional writer makes a business out of that ability to communicate story. Given the amount of bad writing that earns money, I wouldn't go as far as to say professional writers are held to a better standard, but they're definitely held to a different standard. Author Neil Gaiman wants to find a good story as one that keeps the reader turning pages to see what happens next. Despite that elegantly simple definition, with so many people seeking the writer's life, an entire industry has evolved that's devoted to finding and teaching ways to write good or successful stories, providing legions of advice and Byzantine rules. Which brings me to my second point. If we accept storytelling as a natural part of the human experience, any and all of these rules are newcomers to the party. Just as people successfully used language long before anyone invented the word grammar, they were also successfully telling stories long before anyone said there were rules. So, unlike the instructions for building a car or repairing a leaky faucet, storytelling rules are at best attempts to conjure something organic from the abstract, like magicians or Dr. Frankenstein. This doesn't mean they can't help or that ignoring them is wise, but the more successful a story is, the more the rules seem to vanish. The more we become focused not on the plot structure, the character development, or the words themselves, but in the fictive world those words conjure. You know, that thing you get lost in when you're reading. Now that I've made it clear there are no rules, let's talk about them. There are three essential components to any story. Character, conflict, and closure. We'll shortly discuss a fourth, complications, but that's really more about taking an established melody and turning it into a symphony. The three basics are usually presented in this order, but that can be deceptive. They really represent a dynamic system in which none of these pieces really even exist without the others. Briefly put, character can't exist without conflict, and conflict always implies closure. As a result, when I talk about any of these components in later lectures, I'll also be referring to the others. For instance, when I discuss character, I'll also mention conflict. So just to shake things up a bit, I'm going to switch them around and begin with the one that I think best explains the human dependence on story. Conflict. Human beings naturally desire equilibrium, a lack of tension. When we encounter any sort of conflict, part of us wants to see it resolved. The word implies a fight, but it's much more than that. It can mean a battle between a hero and a villain, or unrequited love, or an elevator that never arrives, or even the plus sign in a mathematical formula. Dear heavens, the two and the two are exactly the same. But what will happen if they're added? Will they lose their identity? Become something greater? Or both? Ultimately, it's really closer to a battery that propels story events. Conflict can come from anywhere. But the first and easiest way we divvy up reality is into the internal and the external. The me and the not me. Likewise, conflict can be external. If I don't get money, I'll lose my house. Internal. I hate money, but I was taught to love it. Or a mix. I hate money, but if I don't get some, I'll lose my house. If conflict is an imbalance, the better the conflict, the more we want to see that balance restored. A great conflict makes us ache to see that balance restored. The second element is character. 
As I said, none of these elements exist without each other, but clearly, conflict can't exist in and of itself. It requires objects in order to manifest. In a story, we call these objects, whatever they are, animal, vegetable, mineral, or idea, characters. Aside from being the vessel that contains the conflict, characters are also touch points for reader involvement. Good characters keep us involved. Great characters keep us riveted. Some editors, writers, and readers believe that a sympathetic character is necessary for that involvement. While that's a valid, reliable way to go, the relationship can be much more complicated. We may root for a sympathetic character to succeed, or we may enjoy seeing an unsympathetic character fail. It's also possible not to root for anyone, to simply want to see how balance is restored. More on that later. The final basic piece of a story is closure. Just as conflict can't exist without character, conflict also by its nature implies its own resolution. In other words, the nature of the conflict limits the ways in which it can be resolved. If the conflict is unrequited love, the closure isn't going to be someone winning a lottery. This is not to say that a character can't win a lottery during the course of a love story, but the closure to that conflict occurs when the character learns whether their love will be returned or not. More than that, there are really only three basic possibilities for closure. Positive, evil is defeated. Negative, everyone dies. Or neutral, the conflict cannot be resolved. Good closure ties up the story in a satisfying way. Great closure ties up the story in a memorable way. So now that we've defined the three basic story components, let's use them in a simple story. Joe has to get a payment to the bank to keep his house. And he does. The end. The character is Joe, the conflict is his need to get the payment to the bank, and the closure is the fact that he succeeds. Again, though we talk about these components as if they're separate things, they're not. Joe's conflict, his need to get that payment to the bank, is part of his character. If it wasn't, if he didn't care about getting the payment in, there wouldn't be a conflict. Likewise, the closure is implicit in the conflict. Joe either makes the payment, doesn't make the payment, or circumstances change so that he no longer needs to make the payment. Is that it for the basics? Yes and no. A thousand years ago, I attended a presentation in which I first heard of the fourth, heightening the tension. Sticking with alliteration, I'm calling it complications. The reason I say yes and no is because complications are really just additional conflicts that delay the final closure. Properly used, complications can change the story from a simple two-step dance to an intricate ballet. Adding a few complications to our simple scenario might look something like this. Joe has to get a payment to the bank to keep his house, but he runs out of gas. On the way to a gas station, he falls into a river. A hungry grizzly bear, an excellent swimmer, dives in after him. Joe decides that the only way to save himself is to somehow get on the bear's back. Notice that in these complications, the bear and the river can be seen as metaphors for Joe's financial conflict, a way of understanding his basic problem by comparing it to other ideas. In this sense, the river can be seen as his drowning debt. The hungry bear is the foreclosing bank. Honestly, I wasn't thinking that when I made up this example. Sometimes I suspect that any complication can be interpreted as a metaphor for the basic conflict. If you can think of one that can't, please let me know. Once character and conflict are established, closure is implicit, meaning that the biggest leeway comes in the form of complications. So of the four story elements, complications may provide the biggest opportunity for creativity. As a final point, to extend the earlier dance metaphor, if we think of the character as the dancer, the conflict as gravity, and the closure is hitting the ground, the complications, then, are the dance itself. I began this discussion with conflict. In practical terms, though, in order to see conflict, we have to see what the conflict is acting on, which is why the list usually begins with character. In practice, a story doesn't have to unfold in this order. Character and conflict are often introduced simultaneously, or a narrator might open with a discussion of the conflict before even introducing a specific character, like this. Take it from me, paying bills can be a pain. Why I knew this one fellow, Joe. It's also common to begin a story in medias res, in the middle of things. The original Star Wars opens with a battle, before we even know who anybody is. John Milton's epic poem Paradise Lost, about the battle between Satan and God and the creation of man, begins with Satan in hell, tied to a burning lake, after the war in heaven is over. Milton, a master of storytelling and juggling complication, later gives us that war as a flashback. To use in media res, in our far simpler example, the story could begin with Joe in the river, watching the bear swim inexorably toward him while he's still thinking about how he has to get to the bank. Other experiments abound. Many stories and television series, including Seinfeld and the X-Files, have experimented with episodes that tell the story backwards, presenting the closure first and ending with the conflict. To end with my initial point, if story, like language, predates any rules, these four components are hardly a final definition. On the other hand, I've yet to encounter a story 
that doesn't somehow, in some way, fit these criteria. From free verse poetry to a treatise on quantum mechanics, I honestly believe that some form of story, that basic quality of tension and release, has to be present. Even when we experience a story told in media rest or backwards, we are piecing it back together in chronological order. These variations themselves become a type of conflict or complication that makes us seek balance. In other words, they work because of our innate understanding of story. So in conclusion, while not absolute in any sense, these basic rules provide several things. An easy way to think of stories, a handy way to build a story from scratch, and a way to decide what to include when crafting a query. That said, please check out my complete course, available through the link below, for a closer look at each component in more detail. Thanks.